The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Last week, we studied the 10th chapter, 15 through 17. Actually, we, we went through 18. <clears throat> but 15 through 17... Um, let's see, 15, 16, 17, yeah. Well, 15, it does in English too. 15 through 17, Hebrews 10, 15 through 17 is one Greek sentence. And then verse 18. And last time we studied in this passage um, the establishing of new covenant doctrines. The, and what we're going to do today is we're going to look at one of those doctrines. It's all right. Uh, how does that work? Well, listen, better your phone than your wallet. So... Consider that a blessing. <laughs> what we're going to look at, the writer, what we're going to look at is the, new, the approach of the new covenant to the concept of forgiveness. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Well, listen, whatever you do, do not mess your arm up. All right, just take the whole bag. <laughs> Most of us know that feeling, don't we? If you're a guy, if you're a guy, you know that feeling. That's not a problem. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't realize that there is a lot of difference between forgiveness in the Old Testament and forgiveness in the New Testament. There's a lot of difference between the Old Covenant forgiveness and the New Covenant forgiveness. And the writer is going to bring that out tonight. Look at verse 18. Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. For where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. Hebrews 10 to 18. Now I'm going to show you tonight that how the new covenant is superior to the old covenant in doctrines. And one of them is forgiven. Big, deal, big doctrine, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a giant doctrine right there. But what an enormous doctrine it is. Um, Yeah, let's see. Wrote that down. Where did I write it? Well, I couldn't grab it right away. I'll grab it later. Oh, look at look at um, look at nine twenty six for a moment. Nine twenty six. Now, the 10th chapter, when it gets, you know, 8, 9, and 10, talks about the superiority of the new covenant over doctrines. And here's a doctrine of forgiveness, and the new covenant knocks it out of the ballpark. Of verse 26, otherwise, he's talked about um, Christ uh, should, in verse 25, Christ should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year after year with blood, not his own. Otherwise... He would not need to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the consummation of the ages, that's the coming of Christ. He has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And he goes on to talk about the, the importance of that. And now what he's going to get into, he's talking about the importance of Christ coming and completing redemption. That's the whole point of this. And you recall how we, we studied that. Um, under the old covenant, uh, the old covenant, 
but the animal sacrifice couldn't take away sin. It wasn't intended to. It was intended to point him to Christ, the coming of Christ who could take away sin. So they had to do it every year, had to do it several times a year, right? I mean, the seven big festivals was all about animal sacrifices and things of that nature. Well, we're going to look at that tonight. We're going to show you how the, the doctrine of forgiveness, well, e even the doctrine of redemption. I mean, it wasn't completed in the Old Testament. It wasn't completed until Christ came and completed it on the cross. Everything pointed you to the coming of Christ to complete it. Remember that? Gee whiz, guys. We pounded that pretty heavy. <clears throat> okay. So we're, we're going to look at that. Now, one of the things that's interesting um, in verse 18, there is no verb. You say there isn't mine. Yeah, but there shouldn't be. The word there is is used twice, and it's not in the original text. It's put in there to supplement, you know. If you've taken a foreign language, you know when you translate in your language, you just put things in to make it smooth translations. And um, and they, they did it here. Now, for some of us, like here, that gets kind of technical to some of us. There is no verb, and I'm going to tell you that's enormous. There's no verb in this sentence. There's a, it's a sentence without a verb. Now, in the Greek language, you could do that because the verb has been previously stated. The verb has been previously stated. And it's been previously stated. I'll show it to you. And it's kind of interesting because it's a infinitive. And it's used in the most unique way. For example, look in verse 5. 10th chapter, verse 5. Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says. Okay. Then we get down to verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also bearing witness to us. For after saying that there's your key verb. Now watch this key verb. This is a key, this is a key verse that is going to work its way all the way down to verse 18, which does not have a, a verb. So you're looking for a verb. Private. Now watch this. <clears throat> verse 15. And the Holy Spirit also bearing witness to us for after saying. Now watch. <clears throat> then he quotes 15, 16. He only quotes two, ver two parts of the. He only we studied this last time. He only, he only um, translated two verses out of the new covenant. New covenant is Jeremiah 31 through 33, uh, 34, he only quotes 34 and 35. And he only quotes part of it because he's only using it to show you uh, the superior of the new covenant. Now watch this. So, and wh who is the subject of for saying? In verse 15, who's the subject? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is saying. Then he, then he, he lays out verse 33, Jeremiah 31, 33, makes a point. Then, see, it's in italics. He then says, do you have italics there? Well, the, right? The reason it's italics, it's not there. It's understood to be there. Now he quotes, and, and, and when it, it's a he with a capital H, who is the he? It's the Holy Spirit, right? It's the Holy Spirit, specifically member of the Godhead, right? The Holy Spirit, for after saying, Holy Spirit says, then he says again, right? That's what he's talking about the Holy Spirit. So you see that the key word in this thing is for saying, and he quotes 33, then he quotes 34 because he's going to make a point in verse 18. There is no verb in the Greek language in that verse. Now, you say, well, okay. When there is no verb, when there is no verb to work off from, then what do you do with adjectives or adverbs? I mean, what do you do with adverbs? Right? Adverb. If you don't have a verb, what, what's the adverb? Right? So when you don't have it, then there's a shuffling. In the Greek language, they understood that. So... What you look for is what's carrying the load. What looks like an adverb 
that's not going to be an adverb. I know you don't pay that much attention to this stuff, but listen, that's why I paid the big bucks. And this is what juices me, all right? So I'm going to tell you what happens in here. For example, when it says where, <clears throat> like where, uh, there is no longer any, where there is forgiveness of these things, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. What you have, because you don't have a verb, you don't have adverbs, you have stuff that looks like adverbs, but they're, they're uniquely used as conjunctions. That's why some of us really study the language. So we have that, and we'll, we'll talk about that after a word of prayer, okay? We're going to need a word of prayer for this. I can see that right now. We're going to need a word of prayer. Now, listen, if you had a Greek Testament, if you had a Greek Testament, you can buy them. You can get an, you can get an interlinear Greek. I recommend an NASV, a New American Standard Version. But you can get one. It has the English and the Greek with it. And you can see so far, you could have a Greek text. You can see everything I just said. You... And we're going to start Greek sometime this year. And anybody can take it. And anybody can learn it. So, you know, if you're interested, we'll tell you what it is. I don't know, but it'll be after this semester. But anyhow, let, let's have a word of prayer. Let's, let's go. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it, nor can apply it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in the Christian life. Sin, personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or vert sins. What do you do? How do you get out of carnality and back into spirituality? First John 1 John 1.9 says, confess your sin. If you want to be restored to fellowship of verse 5, you got to work verse 7. 7 is that Christ came, died on the cross to cleanse us from our sins. How does it work in the Christian life? Confession of sin. When you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so there you have it. So confession of personal sin. You do it in privacy, you do it. In the silence of your own heart as you examine yourself, you make your confessions to the Lord and be restored and study the Bible. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, there is no Greek in 1018. It works off the Greek sentence which is one sentence, verses 15, 16, 17, is one Greek sentence. It shows that way in my Bible, my English Bible. And the verb has a definite article and is a perfect infinitive, which is big, big stuff in itself, which we've already discussed. And he's quoting parts of verse Jeremiah 31, 33, and parts of Jeremiah 31, 34, in verses 15 through 17, and now he makes a doctrinal statement about the superiority of the New Covenant doctrines compared to how the, the, for example, forgiveness. How was it used in the Old Testament compared to how is it used today? Well, it's been su super upped compared to the Old Testament. It's been, it's lights out above it. And so we're going to talk about that. Let me lay out verse 18 for you as how it should really look. Because there is no verb. The word now is day, D-E, and it's an explanatory conjunction connected, connecting us back up with uh, the verse, the sentence prior to that, which is verses 15 through 17. All right? Now, you want to pay attention because I laid this verse out so that you can see three conjunctions that are really important. And they look like adverbs often. They often look like adverbs. Now, day doesn't, but it's translated now. Day, day is a typical conjunction. Uh, it explains the Holy Spirit uh, teaching an important New Testament doctrine because we still talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, the Holy Spirit says, and now we're down to a conclusion with that. So... 
The Holy Spirit is the one who introduced Jeremiah to the new covenant. And 800 years or so better later, we're, we're, they're now in uh, Hebrews exercising it. Um, so he says now, and, and he's talking, he's going to talk about the, what's he going to talk about? Forgiveness. It should be underlined in your Bible. No, I don't underline it in your Bible, but I mean, that's the point, right? Now, where there is forgiveness of these things, there's no longer any offering for sin. So that's important. Now, the second, the second conjunction that's important, gives the appearance of an adverb, is a uh, hopo. And it's what we call a local conjunction. When it's used this way, it's used, it's used like an adverb. But it's actually what they call a local conjunction to introduce us to the doctrine, what it was like in the Old Testament, which is chapters 8, 9, and 10, how it was in the Old Testament compared to what it's like in the New Testament. When you read the New Testament about forgiveness, it's lights out above what it was in the Old Testament. Other than the word forgiveness, there's no comparison. Them. <clears throat> and, and he gives you the word. <clears throat> now, um, apparently I'll come back to that. I'm, I'm going to come back to the word forgiveness as a compound word. This, this word in the King James, I think, would probably be a remission or remit. The word forgiveness. Does it say forgiveness? Verse 18. Remission. Remission. <clears throat> That's the same thing. It's an English word. <clears throat> it's forgiveness. <clears throat> They're taking it in more a literal interpretation. <clears throat> what? what? It's yeah, it's forgiven. <clears throat> but the other is fine because it stands more to what the original, what the intent was in the Old Testament and how it's been changed. In the Old Testament, it was about remission of sin, canceling the debt, yada, yada. While it still has that idea, it's now talked about forgiveness in the New Testament. <clears throat> so that's kind, of, that's kind of an important, and the writers told you, don't miss the change. Don't miss the change, because what I'm talking about is forgiveness, not, re not the remission, not the debt canceled, even though that's important. I'm talking about what you get from it. And, and that's a, a forgiveness. You know, you, you owe a debt. Jesus tells a parable. You owe a debt which you couldn't pay. <clears throat> the guy who holds a note on you comes along and says, you don't have to pay it. Oh, he went, oh, wow. I mean, you couldn't have paid. He couldn't have paid it two lifetimes of what his job was paying him. The guy just forgives him. Well, somebody owes him a little pity stuff. It owes him lunch money. He takes him to court, wrings his neck, is unmerciful to him, right? The whole idea in that was Old Testament talking about the remission uh, of the debt that you couldn't pay. And what they didn't have an idea about, and, they, and so when he's talking about that parable, he's talking about Old Testament concept of remission or canceling out a debt. <clears throat> and that you have the power over this stuff. In the New Testament, they never look at that. It all begins with the cross. Everything begins with the cross of Christ. Everything under the new covenant. If you don't begin with the cross of Jesus Christ, nothing works. Everything. He came into this world, was put on a cross for the sin issue. He is the redeemer. He is the mediator. He is everything. If you don't go to the cross, you get none of the stuff. I don't care what church you go to. So that's important. So he uses it, the word where, which is now, while it looks like conjunction uh, adverb, it's a local conjunction pushing us to understand that we now have a change in the way we're going to interpret this word. You understand? And the reason... There's a whole new look at forgiveness is because Jesus Christ came and died on the cross one time for all time, and he changed the theology. The theology has changed from old covenant theology to new covenant theology, 
and where the old covenant was dealing with a partial redemption, a redemption that was not complete, the cross brings completion to the subject of redemption. And everything under that subject of redemption has been changed because of the work of Christ on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Nobody had that before. We're the most privileged people in the whole wide world, and we, we have little respect for it, in my opinion. It's just my opinion. Where, where there is no where there is, notice I crossed it out, where forgiveness jumps right into it, where forgiveness of these things, what is that? It's been the subject of verses 8, 9, and 10, the change of everything that was under the old law of shadow Christology has been changed under the, the new law, under the new covenant. Everything. <laughs> Everything has been changed. I mean, just, just look at the temple in itself. Gone. I mean, that was animal sacrifice. Gone. Law fulfilled. And when you walk in the power of the Spirit, the law is fulfilled. You can't fulfill the law in the flesh. It was never intended to do it. It was, condemned to, it was in designed to condemn you, show you you needed a Savior, and point you to Him. We're so goofy today. It's so goofy. The word no longer. See the word no longer? There is no longer. See the word no longer? Mm. That's made a compound. The O-U-K is ook and ete. You separate those two. It's a negative temporal conjunction. Is the way it's used in this because there is no verb. So the conjunctions are all elevated into different positions in the Greek language, that they are legitimate. They can do that. They're legitimate. No longer any offering. Now, this no longer means no longer. You once owned a house. You lived in that house. You had several kids in that house. And you sold the house, and now you've, you're living on Happy Street, right? You went from Poor Street to Happy Street, right? You're now living on Happy Street. So when you drive, drive past, past the old house and show the people, show your kids where you came from and the struggle you had to get where you are, which they don't give a rip about, which is okay, but it's still your story to tell. And we all do that, don't we? We would like to if they'd listen. Anyhow, you have to get them really early. And you probably have to do it without a cell phone <laughs> if you're going to have any conversation with them. But when you drive past, you go like, no longer. No longer. It's just a fading memory. It's passed away. We've gone to new places and new things. It's no longer. That's what he means here. It's no longer. No longer. I mean, you can't stop at that house and get out and go and spend the night. You get shot. You might get shot in her neighborhood and not even get out of your car. But no longer. See, and the writer is really making a deal out of that. I, I told you the word now, where, and no longer are dynamite. There's no verb. They've, they have been elevated as a conjunction working, working off from a main verb the Holy Spirit taught. This in the Old Covenant in Jeremiah 31. We're living it out in the reality of everyday life now. So that's what he, no, and so no longer what? There's no longer any offering for sin. 
Do you realize that when you confess your sin? You know where that goes back to? It goes back to the cross where Christ died on the cross. That, it's where it goes back. Where do you think you're, when you confess your sin, where do you think that thing, where do you think that, th that payment comes from? Right? Who canceled that debt into your life that you don't have to pay it? Right? It don't matter how much the sin, he paid for it all. I don't give you got a, a you know, if you, if, you got, if you take you three lifetimes to pay it off, or, 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 or two, two or three working days, you get the same treatment because that's grace. Isn't that something? The law never understands that. And Christians, of all people, should know that. But we have a tendency to look down our nose that somebody's got a big debt of sin and think, oh, boy, it'll be hard for them to get in. But we'll breeze in because we're good people. That ain't true either. It's not true either. Listen, don't miss the point. There is no, listen, what Christ coming to the world, consummation of the ages, goes to the cross. There, there is no longer any offering for sin. That offering is done deal. That's a done deal. And if you think there's some other way to get your sins dealt with, whether an unbeliever or a believer, there's the same cross. When you come to the cross as an unbeliever, you got to believe that Christ died there for my sins. When you come as an unbeliever, uh, as a believer, as an unbeliever, that's what you have to. As a believer, you have to confess your sin because you know where your life started. It started at the cross. Your Christian life started at the cross, or it didn't start. And confession of sin takes you back to the cross and tells you why, why your life needs to be changed. You don't need to keep coming back and laying that sin upon this cross all the time. You need to change. You need to live in the power of the Holy Spirit because when you live in the power of the Holy Spirit, you do not fulfill the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the flesh is personal sin, talked by James in 1, 14 and 15. I don't know that any of us really understand that every time you confess your sin, it takes you back to the cross, and you look up on the cross, and there is Christ hanging, dying for your sins. And he was buried and raised from the dead so the Holy Spirit could live in you to conquer that whole idea. You shouldn't make these constant trips. At some place, you've got to get a hold of your life in, in regard to the issue of sin, personal sin. But thank God that he designed a program that took care of us when we committed personal sin our way back. Our way back is to confess our sins. Confessing your sins puts you at the cross as a believer not as an unbeliever. And, and if the cross means anything to you, then confession of sin should be a, a, a tough deal with you. It shouldn't be a ho-hum, ho everyday deal. It should be a, a difficult issue. You, you understand what I mean by that? I mean... Your confession of sin takes you back to the cross. You look on the cross, and there's the man who died for you, for your sins. No verb. The word for is interesting. Sets up a prepositional idea without a verb. For, peri plus agentive means in, in reference to. No longer in reference to sin. <clears throat> so let's talk about a few things. Let's talk about a few things because these three conjunctions were, were, were markers to lay, these are markers to lay out the principle of forgiveness Forgiveness in reference to sin. Okay? Point number one. The Greek word for forgiveness is a compound word. I wrote it on your paper. The AP on the front of that word is the preposition apo, and it means away from, to remove something away from. Away from. And Jaime, H-I-E-M-I, means to send, and therefore it means to send away from. The word forgiveness in the Greek language. It means 
to send away from. Okay? Forgiveness is having your sins sent away from you. They're pardoned. They're forgiven. They're sent away from you. As far, listen, as far as the east is from the west. Sent away from you. Now listen, in the Old Testament, it was year after year and constant. It's repetitive because Christ hadn't come. It's repetitive for one reason. It wasn't to develop a way of life. It wasn't designed to develop a way of life. It was develop, developed to remind you to be on the alert. Christ could come at any time. In the Old Testament, Christ could come at any time. In the Old Testament, talking about the first coming of Christ, he could come at any time. It was eminent. That's why they set up a genetic seed starting from Adam to Seth, you know, to, and, uh, to um, well, anyhow, you know the whole thing till Christ comes. All right. In the new covenant, forgiveness, it means to be released, pardoned, forgiven completely. See, it was temporal in the Old Testament. Temporal. Temporal. Waiting for, the, for Christ to come, to die on the cross, to complete redemption. In the new covenant, forgiveness works off a completed redemption. When you go to the cross and believe that Jesus died there for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, when you believe it, the gospel is the power of God to save you, and you're in a completed salvation. You're in a completed package. Listen. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 39 and 40, the last two verses tell you, and not only is your salvation completed, but everybody in the Old Testament is completed with you. He wrapped up the whole deal. Everybody that was a believer in the Old Testament, their redemption got, got fulfilled, and everybody in ours get it fulfilled, and everybody until the second coming of Christ, they're under that banner. Now, in the New Covenant, forgiveness, it means to be released, pardoned, forgiven completely. That's the key word. From an unpardonable debt of sin, both in penalty and power. Both in penalty. Adam's original sin deals with the penalty. Thirteen judicial charges against you that you could, that a debt you could never pay on your own. Only way it could be paid is through Jesus Christ. When you come to Jesus Christ through the gospel, boom, it's paid. Paid what? In full. And any debt that is incurred after that, paid in full. That's why all we have to do is confess it. He died one death for what? All sin. Died one death for all sin. Past, present, and future. That's how that works. And so when he died on the cross for us, there was the penalty of sin. You know, dying you will die business that he said to Adam. For, it, you know, for by one man, sin into the world and death by sin. And so death spread to all men for all of sin. That's Adam. So the, the penalty is taken care of. And not only that, listen, here's what the Old Testament didn't have. The moment Adam's sin is dealt with, Right? At the moment of salvation, that's dealt with 13 judges, charge removed from your life, never come back, never held accountable ever again, debt paid in full. You with me? At the same time, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life, and the power of sin is now have, has the control through the per person. The third member of the Godhead lives in you. The third member of the Godhead lives inside your body, and he is there <clears throat> to control the lust of the flesh. <clears throat> Galatians 5, 16, 17, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh taken to gratification is sin. James 1, 14 and 15 tell you that. You have no idea how enormously important my lesson tonight is. You really need to study this later.
you really need to pay attention to it. And so the power over the sin nature, not only does the cross provide you one, but his death, burial, and resurrection provide the other, right? And that's what, why this is the gospel. You don't have the gospel as all, you, all you'd preach is a cross. You only got half of it. There's got to be a burial and a resurrection. The second half comes through the resurrection. It is the, listen to me now, the power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you over your mortal body. Mortal body. Need to get that. So the gospel of Jesus Christ, he takes care of the penalty and takes care of the power. The penalty and the power. Where's the power to live the Christian life? In the Holy Spirit. It's not in your behavior. Your behavior does not dictate. Listen, no matter how good your behavior is, unbelievers can duplicate it. Please tell me you know that no matter how much good you try to do, an unbeliever could do it and maybe do it better. Never about behavior. It's not, how, it's not how. Listen, the power to live the Christian life is not in the flesh. It's in the spirit. You've got to be right on top of your game for that. You're the guy who controls that issue. If we walk in the spirit, what do you think he's talking about there? If we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill. If that's volitional. So under the new cabinet, we have complete forgiveness from the penalty of sin, which secures every believer by the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8 in him. Boy, pay attention, because the only way you get into Christ is he dies on a cross, he is buried. Forty days later, he goes back, and he's in heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and you are, at the moment of salvation, baptized by the Holy Spirit into union with Christ. A union can never be violated by anything going on down here at all. That's why in him, that's positional sanctification. We've talked about that. That's a powerful doctrine. That's a powerful doctrine. Ephesians 1, 7, in him, every time you see that word in the new covenant, in him is a dynamite. That little preposition of the deal, in him, is dynamite. In him we have redemption. Where? In Christ. In him we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. See, that takes us judicial. Trespass is what the courts talk about. We talk about sin. They talk about trespasses. It's court. They got to bring up laws and convict you and do a whole lot of stuff. According to, listen, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. You know what the next verse says? You know what verse 8 says? Listen to this. That he's lavished on us. Lavished. <laughs> You know, lavish is one of those words that's just, right? Let's see, can you go back to your, your honeymoon days when you lavished on each other? You remember that? Can you go back that far? Well, okay. You don't want to see his face. You just look at the back of his head. You'll be all right. <laughs> Lavished. Well, he, he got a grin that he hasn't been able to get off his face. So if there's anything to that. Look at Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 12. Not through the blood of goats and calves, yet God said, offer him. Why? Point him to the cross. Galatians 3.24. But through his own blood, he entered the holy place, heaven once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. See, that's where you get that. That's a powerful idea. Colossians, of course, we talk a great deal around here by that. Uh, Colossians 1, 13, 14, Acts 26, 18. 
You see, what we get in Adam, when what we get at the cross, when the gospel, when we come to him, is he removes the debt that we could never pay. That's Adam, that's 13 judicial charges of Adam's original, the penalty of Adam's sin upon the human race. Could never. There's, there's not, nothing you could ever do. That's why it took, it took the Son of God, he who knew no sin became sin for us. That's the only way it could have been done. Pardoned. Pardon from the 13 judicial charges, part of the 50 things you receive. In Acts, uh, I mean, in Hebrews 9.15, therefore, because of this, he is the mediator of the new covenant. Watch this. And the eternal inheritance. In verse 15. Inter eternal inheritance. That's pretty good. I mean, not only did he pay your debt, but he gave you an inheritance. I mean, who would do that? I mean, you have to. You'd have to jump so so through many so through so many hoops, it wouldn't be worth it, right? Oh yeah, I'll leave you an inheritance. Sit, stand, shake. Complete forgiveness from the power of the sin nature is secured by walking by the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Restoration from carnality to fellowship through God by confession of sin. Listen to this. Romans, the sixth chapter, well worth your read. But verse 12 says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you should obey its lust. He goes on to say, when you do, you're in a master-slave relationship. You know who it is? It's to yourself. You're in a master-slave relationship. This is this kid across the street you're dealing with. He's a master-slave relationship with his own self. Nobody's forcing him to do anything. He's doing it all himself, ain't he? It's called addictions. Uh, Romans 8, chapter, verses 1 through 8, it says that we've been set free... Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. Then he goes on to say, you know how you maintain that? Walk in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Galatians 3, 1 through 3, talks about fleshly or carnal. A Latin word for fleshly or carnal. Carnal, we've adapted that, which is fine. Fleshly, carnal. It's a, you know what he says in, in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3? Here's how that, if you live in more carnality than you do spirituality, you're a milk drinker no matter who you think you are. Think about that. If you spend more time in the flesh than you do in the spirit, you're a milk drinker. You're an, listen, you're a baby believer. Oh, you think you know more, but listen, what you're learning about the Word of God, any unbeliever could. He could go to class and get an A. It's the practical application that brings out. Listen, only 50% of your grade comes in class. The other comes in application. Is that education? You hear people say they're, 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 they're book smart. What, what do they mean by that? They can't. They, they, when it comes to application, they ain't got it. Listen, this whole thing is, listen, I'm not, I'm not saying that coming to Bible study is not important. Of course it is. But listen, learning is only half of it living the other half. You learn it to live it. That's why you learn it. You learn it to live it. It's the practical side, not just the theological side. And so Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 1 through 3. And, of course, one we go around here all the time is 1 John 1, 7 through 9. There's three verses in there, dynamite. You should pay attention to them, not just verse 9. In verse 7, he says, It is the blood of Jesus, his son, who cleanses us from all sin. Christ died on that cross. That's why when you confess your sin, you bring it, you're brought back to the cross and say, You know why you have the privilege of confessing? It's because he died on the cross to cleanse you from all sin. And it, it should break your heart to stand at the cross and see the one who suffered for your sin and you take it so casually in your everyday life. I mean, you flip out and just do this and do that and do this and do that. 
then you confess your sin. You don't take it serious. You I mean you need to take it more seriously. You, you need to go back and take a look at the guy who made it provisional for you to just confess your sin. It's not just confess your sin. Now, I'm not trying to put guilt on you. I'm just trying to tell you that you're taking way too casual approach to the privilege. Say it's a privilege. In verse 8, he says, if we say we have no sin, sin nature, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And then he comes to verse 9 and says, confess your sin because it's a privilege. You know, probably most of you in this room grew up with a culture who talked a great deal about respect and privileges. Privileges, things you didn't earn that other people earned for you were high privileges. And I, I grew up in a culture where my parents and grandparents were guys who, who sacrificed greatly warfares and things of that nature, just difficult times. And they they were honest all the time. I mean... When I was with my grandfather going to the town to get mill done to, for the cows on Saturday, if a if a if a hearse came by or somebody was going to the funeral, we pulled off the side of the road. We got out, we took our caps off, and bowed our head until the thing passed. And I didn't care how many cars we were in it. And as a little kid, I mean, I that's just the way. That's just the way we lived. And then when we got back in the car, put our hats back on, then my grandfather would become a great teacher. He would tell me all these things. And of course, I had a dad that died in a war, and so we'd go through all that. And then he had brothers and, you know, we had uncles and all that. It was, it, I mean, he, he didn't just get out of the car. Get out of the car and take your hat off. It wasn't none of that. Is it was all about respect. And when we got back in the car, there was a whole lesson on why there are things that we respect. Why we respect. Hmm? I mean, it was a culture we had. I, you know, it was, it was good in the culture I raised that we had that kind of stuff. We respect the privacy of other people and their property. We didn't invade their space, and we didn't take stuff that didn't belong to us. I mean, if I find... The other day, I got out of my truck. I looked down. There was a penny. You know what I did? I took it in and gave, put it on the counter of Chick-fil-A because it wasn't mine. I didn't put it in my pocket. I couldn't do that. There's no way I could have done that. I, there is no way I could have done that. My grandfather said, do you earn it? I would have said, no, sir. Well, then let's put it someplace else. And if there was no place there to put that money, then I gave it somewhere. I gave that away. I did not put it in my bank. I did not. If I put it in my pocket, it went someplace else. And I would be convicted if I didn't do it. You know, in my own mind, I would be. So it was just the way I was raised. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying it was raised. It was all about respect. It was all about respect. And I don't know what's happened to us, but we're sure losing that fast, aren't we? And it's, you know, I say to my kids when they come in and we sit down at the table and stuff, I, 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 look, you can do several things with your phone, but you can't bring them to the table. I don't care what you do with them. But you can't do that. Well, I don't understand why. Well, I know, and I'm going to teach you. Now, we can do it before we eat, or we can do it while we eat, but I'm going to teach you a lesson. I don't get mad. I don't get huffy and puffy. My grandfather did with me. It was a lesson to be learned. And uh, he approached me in a proper manner, and I tried to do the same thing. But listen, this is family time. Family time is not is not phone time. It's not phone time. It's not TV time. It's not this. Not that. It's time to it's time to be with people that you won't be with maybe in five years from now. And you're gonna go. You're gonna say to yourself, "Then I wish I'd have." Don't have those. I wish I had have moments. Well, here's my second point. The Greek word for where, uh, uh, hopo, is translated as a local conjunction used metaphorically. It's used metaphorically because there, it looks like an adverb. It's not. 
it's used as a local, meaning something's going on that's very dramatic. We're going to put spotlight on it. And it's used what we call metaphoric in the Greek. And it's in reference to the forgiveness for, for new covenant forgiveness because, because there's no verb. For example, here's what the writer's trying to tell us. Let me share with you this word where. The where of 1018 is Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34. And the new covenant, that's verse 16, 17. Okay, so the where points us to the new covenant. The first where points us to the new covenant. The second idea, this is meta metaphoric. The second look that we take at where is the where of the new covenant is the completion of redemption. See, that's what, that's what the new covenant is all about. All right? So there's a second. that I'm telling you what a metaphoric look is. Here's the third. Where the completion of redemption is a sequence. Where the completion of redemption is, there's a completion of the forgiveness of sin. See the word where? All of that is attached to it. Here's the fourth. The where of complete forgiveness of sin brings a promise from God. And their sins, in verse 17, and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. You know what that's under? That's under the new covenant. That's Jeremiah 31, 34. All of that is the word where, not as an adverb, but as a local conjunction, talking about something that's dy dynamic going on. And where is considered to be metaphoric. In other words, take a good look at the picture that you're having. Be sure you pe your people see the bigger picture. This is why I love the Greek language. This is why I study it all the time. And I teach it. And people go like, I, well, I like Ron's teaching, but I wish he would do it. Listen, you wouldn't have any of this had I not been able to break this down and show it to you. And what I just showed you is dynamite. It is dynamite. I'm not, I'm not looking for any, anything out of it. I'm just telling you why the languages sometimes are really important. And when you get into Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, you're into, you're into high cotton. And you really got to pay attention to what the writers are talking about. And I'm trying to help you. Their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Now, I'm going to show you something you can't see. See the word no more? Oh, boy. Look what he did. You remember, I, 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 you remember when I said no longer? It was made up of compound. It had a negative plot ete. Listen what this guy did. <laughs> what he did here. He, let, he separated them this time. He went, Uk, May, that's a double negative. That's a double negative with that day. And this time he separated. He went, Uk, May, Ete. The last time he put Uk and Ete together no longer. This time he drags it out and pounds it. Just, he drags it, he drags this out now in verse 17. This, and who did this? This is Jeremiah. Jeremiah did that. Now, what they did, and when they looked at it, they came back and put that, they put it, and it said, no longer. It's the same concept. This time, they Jeremiah drug it out. When the new come, when Christ comes, and is the mediator of the new covenant, and brings in the new covenant, I will remember sin no more. Think about that. And when he did it, he put, he put the strongest way you could possibly say that. No longer. I mean... That's pretty... That, and that's 17... Here is Hebrews 7, 27. It says, Who does not need daily like those old covenant priests to offer up sacrifices first for their own sins and then for the sins of their people, 
because he, Christ, did once for all when he offered up himself. Then he goes on to a long discussion in the ninth chapter, 12 through 15, on the blood of Jesus Christ, how it's superior. And then, of course, Eucharist last Sunday, we lifted our cups. This is the covenant. This is the new covenant of the blood of Christ. Jeez. Here's point three. God promised all new covenant believers, that be you and I, that all our sins are completely forgiven. You know what he means by for, for, uh, completely forgiven? He means forever. Now, where were they once and completed? Where were they completely forgiven? Where's, where's your redemption completed? Right there on that cross. When you, when you come and receive salvation, you're in a completed forgiveness with God. You're in a completed state of forgiveness. Think about that. That is pretty powerful stuff. And you know what, what I'm talking about? Jesus talked about the, all this stuff is laid out. Jesus in his earthly ministry, all of his parables and everything is dealing with new covenant doctrines, trying to get these people in transition. I just mentioned a few of them. If you went back and studied them now, understanding that he's teaching new covenant doctrines, it would open, it would open doors that you can't imagine for understanding. The parables of Jesus Christ. What, what, what were the doctrines he was teaching about new covenant? That was on its way as soon as he got, dies on that cross, we're in it. In uh, Hebrews 10.10, he says, by this will, which he mentioned in verse 9, take away the first covenant, establish the second covenant. By this will, we have been sanctified in the perfect tense through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. What? Once for all. See, that word sanctified, that word sanctified, set apart, that's positional truth. Set, up, set aside, that's in the perfect tense, completed action. That's completed redemption. And listen, when you come to Christ, you are sanctified. You're set aside unto the holiness of God at the point of salvation. You can never lose that position. You can never lose it. It's in him. <laughs> First Peter, First Peter 2.24 says, He himself or he alone bore our sins in his body on the cross. Paul talked about that in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. We quote it all the time around here. But you know what he was quoting? Isaiah 53, 4. According to the scriptures. That's what he was talking about. In Hebrews 10, 12, we've already studied, but he says, but he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down. You know why that's important? Tell me why sat down. What did the... What did, the, what did the priest do in the Old Covenant? They stood offering. Jesus sat down, which means what? Redemption is complete. When they were standing doing it, they were reminded that redemption was not completed until Christ comes. I'm talking about the priest that made the offerings. Here's one. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time, or completed for all time, those who are sanctified. Here's Hebrews 9, 26, which we talked about. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 10, chapter verse 4, tells us, therefore, it's impossible for shadow Christology, Old Testament blood to take away sins. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 4 says, it was impossible for the blood of goats and calves to take away sin. It was ne They were never intended. They were intended to point to the Messiah who, when he come, would do that. Weiss, a very good Greek man, Weiss makes an important doctrinal uh, conclusion on Hebrews 10, 18. He wrote, he says that in the view of the fact that sin has been paid for, there is no more need of the constant repetition of sacrificial sacrifices or offerings. And that is exactly what the writer is attempting to instill in the minds and the hearts of his readers. Namely, that the new covenant 
in Jesus' blood is superior and takes place of the First Testament Old Covenant in animal blood. And boy, he was right on the money. A good Greek guy. In a, a, little, a little series of books he wrote called Word Studies of the Greek. In closing, the New, New Testament, uh, the New Covenant, the New Covenant forgiveness of sin is given once and forever to every person who believes the gospel of grace, salvation in Jesus Christ. Acts 10, 43, which we talked about, Peter, of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of him. Do you realize what a breakthrough that was to Peter on the idea of forgiveness? Because he grew up with a different view on forgiveness and he has struggled since, since the crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and the ascension in Acts 2. It's Acts 10 that it finally breaks through on him the new covenant doctrine of forgiveness of sin. And with that came to be no respecter of persons. And it was just a light bulb went off inside him. And still, as we talk, Peter is going to struggle with a lot of stuff. But he, he's getting it. And listen, the struggle's okay. Just stay after it and get it. Stay with us. We'll, we'll, we'll walk you through this stuff. Okay? And we, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Yeah? Well, let's close in a word of prayer, and then we'll have our prayer time. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the Internet. Pray tonight, Father, people would understand how powerful the new covenant is. And it all begins with the cross of Jesus Christ, his burial and his resurrection, his ascension, his session, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And we are in a new covenant day. We live in the day of the riches of grace lavished upon us. I pray that we somehow, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, could build the importance of these principles in our life as believers that we might win a, a world that needs Christ. They need the message of the gospel preached by grace, not by works. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.